Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, over the top beautiful day. Here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, and I don't feel like this camera is even looking at this chair. Uh, well, I guess I'm in here a little bit, but I know you're here to see the dog anyway. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to be blinded by the light here right when I'm starting this sermon, and I do apologize for the wind noise, but it is what it is. So uh, it is a gorgeous summer day. It is Sunday, July 17th, 2022. So I need to uh, head up to visit Sister Sandy from Environmental Coffee House uh, on this beautiful day. But before I get out of here, uh, since it is Sunday, it is time for me to bring you our sometimes regularly scheduled Sunday sermon where I go out and uh, surf the web for my fellow Collapsitarians. And I have had sermons from this fellow many times because he is one of my favorite uh, Collapsitarians, and that is Richard Heinberg. I'm sure you know... Uh, some of the works of Richard Heinberg uh, used to be completely associated with peak oil. He's uh, broadened his scope just a little bit and his new essay from this excellent website resilience.org if you are not a fan of resilience.org here in the collapse you need to be just out a couple of days ago and Richard is here to talk about deadly optimism and useful pessimism. Yes, and this is a long... Uh, Richard is not a man of few words. This would probably take me an hour to read this whole thing. I am going to put the link on here. I highly suggest you shut me up and go read this yourself. But if you just want to hear, sit around and listen to some old doomer... Uh, read you a doomsday sermon. I'll be happy to do that on this beautiful day. And uh, I'm not going to get through the whole thing. We're going to, uh, let's see if we make it two-thirds of the way through. Anyway, take it away. Richard Heinberg from Resilience.org. Deadly optimism. Useful pessimism. And I like his first sentence, which pretty much says it all. Humanity is hurtling into an era of ecosystem breakdown and social collapse. That is, so I guess we get an entire era of, uh, of ecological breakdown and, society, and social collapse. Most people will understandably respond with horror, gloom, and hostility. But these reactions will just make matters worse. And, uh, you know, it's not my place here, guys, to argue with Richard Heinberg. What's implied in that sentence is most readers of resilience.org uh, the tiny few people with brains will respond with horror, gloom, and hostility. 99.9% uh, .9 of the planet will not respond with anything because they are completely unaware of the fact that we're hurtling into an era of ecosystem breakdown and social collapse, or if they are made aware of the fact that humanity is hurtling into an era of ecosystem breakdown and social collapse, they don't care. They have no interest in the subject. The biggest story in the history of humanity since we climbed down from the trees I really will try to back off now. I just had to get that off my chest. So we're going to start over. <clears throat> Take it away, Richard Heinberg. Humanity is hurtling into an era of ecosystem breakdown and social collapse. Most people will understandably respond with horror, gloom, and hostility 
but these reactions will just make matters worse. What's really needed is a realistic sense of what is possible in a dogged determination to heal division, protect nature and culture, and build sustainable alternatives to our current fossil fuel-based centralized industrial support systems. Psychologists have a name for this attitude, defensive pessimism, which I'll explore below. What we don't need is uncritical optimism, which contributed to our current mess. So first we're going to talk about optimism and then get into defensive pessimism. So I guess we're coming out, according to our Richard, we're coming out of the era of deadly optimism. Yeah, the one uh, baby step at a time. Okay. Most people's brains have soaked for decades in a marinade of rosy expectations. Since the 1950s, forecasts for the human future could be summarized by the adjectives more, bigger, and faster. Our political leaders and cultural icons encouraged us to think that more human problems, including disease and poverty, will be solved with each passing year, that we will unravel the mysteries of biology, astronomy, and other scientific fields, that we will access limitless new energy sources, and that technology-derived comfort convenience and connectivity will increase and become available to more people. And of course, guys, now the sun, uh, you know, I wanted to get my morning chores done before the sun hit, and now I'm not going to be able to read this now that the sun is hit. Uh, I, I could have done this uh, sermon an hour ago and in the deep shade, I hope I don't fry my dog in the summer sun. All right, back to Richard. Uh, this per pervasive optimism was based on the actual experience of much of humanity, which saw wonders unfold throughout the 20th century. Though a large number of people were not invited to the feast, Indeed, their lives, labor, and resources were part of the menu. New technologies from farm tractors to computers gave humans the ability to do lots of things more quickly and easily, and to do things that were previously unimaginable, like bouncing laser beams off the surface of the moon. Yes, or putting a motor inside your ice cream cone so you don't have to keep turning it yourself. Yes, hundreds of millions of new jobs sprang up in thousands of new occupational fields. Scientists sequenced the human genome and gathered data from the fringes of the universe. Lifespans increased Wages for most workers rose, enabling them to buy more stuff. And many businesses enjoyed decade after decade of brimming profits with owners of stocks and bonds happily coming along for the joyride. Optimism was a self-reinforcing feedback the system delivered more. People came to expect more. So the system was primed to deliver still more. The result was continued economic growth with the global economy doubling in size every two or three decades. This always accelerating conveyor belt 
of industrial production and disposal depended not just on the increased availability of energy and materials, but also on rising expectations. Optimism greased the wheels of commerce with society operating as an optimism generating machine. So his next chapter is called Tipping into Pessimism. I'm going to see if opening this door of the tiny house. No, I was hoping that would give me some shade. Maybe, uh, you know, I think it might just be, maybe I can at least get my computer a little bit in the shade behind the door here. I don't know. I mean, do you guys really care if you can't see the left side of me? Anyway, tipping into pessimism. Of course, there was a downside to fossil-fueled, optimism-propelled growth, exponentially increasing humanity's resource extraction, industrial production, and waste dumping resulted in far more pollution of the environment. The most insidious form of pollution turned out to be the greenhouse gases released from the burning of fossil fuels, which are now undermining climate stability and throwing into doubt the survival not only of human civilization, but also that of millions of other species. At the same time, these activities steadily depleted resources, both renewable ones like fish, forest, and fresh water, and non-renewable ones like metal ores and fossil fuels themselves. Even the minerals needed to replace fossil fuels with alternative energy sources like solar panels and wind turbines are depleting quickly, limiting the long-term prospects of green growth. Industrial expansion also crowded out wild nature with populations of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and insects declining by two-thirds on average during the past half century. At the same time, economic inequality increased to grotesque extremes. News about these worrisome developments has tended to trickle out to the general public in occasional disconnected stories to which only a minority pay attention, which of course is directly uh, contradicting the second sentence of his sermon. Yes, one-tenth of one percent of humanity uh, counts as a minority. <clears throat> Nevertheless, you know, despite the fact that nobody cares about the biggest story on the planet, Nevertheless, the accumulating weight of scientific studies and news reports, in addition to the lived experience of increasing numbers of people who have been forced to flee wildfires and floods or to endure famine, is leading to a gradual but widespread shift in attitude. And uh, the reason that Sancho Panza and I are living in upstate New York instead of the Pacific Northwest is where we were planning to be is because of the wildfires. We were fleeing wildfires when Sandy uh, Shellis convinced us to come check out upstate New York to uh, dig our heels in for the collapse. Um, if I can get through the sun. <clears throat> in short, it is becoming apparent to a rapidly growing portion of the global populace, though 
perhaps not yet a majority. Yes, perhaps not yet a majority. Uh -huh. <clears throat> that expectations of perpetually having more cannot continue to be met. The price of 70 years of unconsidered optimism is coming due. Now the human world is flipping to a status where most things will be continually getting worse. There you go, which is the other bottom line of this. Uh, one more time. Now, meaning right now, July 16th, July 17th, 2022, is the definition of the word now in this case. The human world and the world of every single living creature on the planet is flipping to a status where most things will be continually getting worse. Housing and food are becoming less affordable. Institutions are becoming less stable and functional. Not only are natural disasters becoming more frequent and severe, but recovery from them is more problematic. Supply chains are less reliable. Authoritarianism is on the rise. The economic playing field is increasingly tipped in favor of those already wealthy. Political polarization is spiking and the ability of governments to solve problems is waning. That sums it up pretty well. All of these trends are serious enough, but for people who study underlying system dynamics, concern runs even deeper. Many scientists believe that impacts of climate change have been underestimated by officials. Do you think so? The world's oceans, which supply half of Earth's oxygen, appear to be dying. A third of the planet's farmable topsoil is already gone due to industrial agriculture, and in a business-as-usual scenario, the rest of the soil will disappear in just 50 years. Fossil fuels are depleting rapidly, but alternative energy sources will not be capable of replacing them at our current rate of energy uses, usage. We live, after all, on a finite planet. It takes a while for the weight of all of this information to sink in. For many people in the prime of life or older, optimism still reigns. Do you need to get out of the sun? My little dog is, uh, why don't you go in the tiny house where it's nice and cool. You get under the bed in the nice, cool, tiny house. I think I'm going to join Sancho Panza in the, uh, in the tiny house. We're starting to fry, guys. So I'm going to turn this camera around and go join my little dog in the tiny house. Because... Man, and I'm not complaining. This is upstate New York. Uh, Alright, I have no idea what is in that camera's... Come on. Anyway, you know what I look like. <clears throat> I don't know what you're looking at, but I think you know what I look like. Anyway, <clears throat> for many people in the prime of life or older, optimism still reigns. Indeed, it is easy to cite examples of futurists and think tanks still pumping out childishly imaginative, limit-free version, limit-free visions of what humanity will achieve in the remainder of this century. 
but surveys say that more than two-thirds of Americans today believe today's children will be financially worse off than their parents and according to another recent poll roughly half of 10,000 people aged 16 to 25 surveyed across 10 countries think that humanity is doomed. There you go. Three quarters of the group surveyed, you know, of 16 to 25 year olds think that the future is frightening. In China, the buy lawn or let it rot movement is spreading among young people. The slang term was coined to reflect a sense of doom and despondency. Chinese urban unemployment for people aged 16 to 25 is running over 18 percent and millions who have trouble finding jobs are simply shelving long-term plans and staying home watching TV. The future is hopeless, so why bother? But time wasted in binge watching is hardly the worst possible outcome from optimism's reversal. A growing sense of nihilism, I've heard that word nihilism and nihilism. Uh, I think I like the sound of nihilism even better. A growing sense of nihilism among young people worldwide has in some cases contributed to alt-right movements that are bent on authoritarianism, misogyny, and race baiting. If optimism supercharged humanity's euphoric wave of expansion in recent decades, rising pessimism could accelerate all the disintegrative trends, environmental, political, economic, and social that we may face in the coming decades. Um, all right, the next chapter is the psychology of hope and gloom. And uh, that'll take us to about halfway. So I am going to read The Psychology of Hope and Gloom. And you can go to the uh, link and read the second half of this excellent uh, essay yourself. Okay. The Psychology of Hope and Gloom. At the same time as we are cresting last century's wave of giddy optimism and beginning our descent, psychologists are learning more about how personal frames of mind shape our actions, health, and daily experience. In clinical studies, it has been found that having a positive outlook on life is associated with 35% lower rates of heart disease and 14% reduced rates of early death. Optimists also have better coping skills. Well, we'll, we'll see about that over the next uh, few years. Intend to engage in healthier behaviors such as diet, exercise, etc. Some psychologists believe a cheerful outlook is also an evolutionary advantage. According to terror management theory, yes, Mr. Bumblebee, there is no insect apocalypse here at Bugs in a Jar. According to terror management theory, once humans developed language and a consciousness of death, they tended to become vulnerable to psychological paralysis, knowing that personal oblivion could come at any moment. The belief in an afterlife may have emerged as an adaptation that enabled people to engage in everyday activities less burdened by their awareness of their mortality. Today, billions of people believe that when they die, 
they will be reunited with their loved ones and will enjoy an eternity of bliss. The fact that these beliefs have spread and, persist, uh, and persisted in the absence of physical evidence to support them suggests, suggests they meet some deep <laughs> personal need. Do you think so? Meanwhile, even though pessimism may lower your life expectancy, which of course could be something to be optimistic about, it turns out to have its own slate of advantages. A certain type of pessimism, which experts call defensive pessimism, I call it having a brain, is linked to the ability to make more accurate predictions and to better assess risks and threats. Defensive pessimists don't just have a gloomy outlook. They have learned to harness negative thinking to improve their coping and adaptive skills through goal orientation. They think and plan more carefully than others. The motivating ideal of the defensive pessimist might be stated as respecting limits and living well within them. Yes. However, there is also a more familiar kind of pessimism characterized by the tendency not only to expect the worst, but to give up trying to improve one's life conditions and instead to blame oneself or others for unwanted outcomes. This kind of pessimism can be demoralizing, dispiriting, and even enraging. People who frame their world this way tend to experience more isolation, greater conflict and stress, poorer health, and reduced well-being. One could argue that defensive pessimism is not pessimism at all, but something more akin to realism, a wise middle ground between two positions that are both ultimately cop-outs to responding rationally and usefully to what transpires. But, and then he goes on, uh, talking more about trying to predict are, uh, are more people going to go into defensive pessimism or what I call uh, the Michael Rupert. Uh, yep. As they figure out what will it take for individuals and communities to survive the coming era psychologically, socially, and physically. Only an obdurate defensive pessimism will help. Yes. Uh, and then they talks about swimming against the tide in bucking the herd uh, and, and how to defend yourself against useless optimism. Um, good Lord. And then he, uh, then he lists a few examples of what community-based defensive pessimism might actually look like. Uh, good Lord, let's get down to the bottom paragraph of this excellent rant. Defensive pessimist. Defensive pessimist. Hey, that's a terrible label for recruiting purposes. 
let's just call ourselves resilience builders are unlikely to become the majority in the years and decades ahead just as those who questioned growth were a neglected minority during the century of over-optimism. But resilience builders may end up making the crucial difference between survivable hard times and utter human failure. Amen, uh, Brother Richard Heinberg. And as I say, you can go on the link to read the rest of this. Oh, I meant to start this out with a, uh, a quote from Plato that uh, Brother Alistair sent me yesterday that I really enjoyed. I meant to open that rant uh, from Richard Heinberg with this quote from Plato, but we will close with it instead. Take it away, Plato. Those who are able to see beyond the shadows and lies of their culture will never be understood, let alone believed by the masses. By the masses. Poor Plato uh, was dealing with, uh, with clueless morons way back then. And we're still dealing with them, but anyway, I have got to wrap this up because I am hungry. I have to throw one of my fellow earthlings on the grill, take a, uh, take a hot shower, and then head up to Sandy's house where I'm going to buy some more uh, hemlock lumber from the Amish dude tomorrow to build our next tiny house. I highly suggest you get out there and build a tiny house while you still can. Bye guys. Let me look in this camera, have I been? All right. Okay, little dog, we're done.